Hi, this is Judy Warner. I'm so excited to introduce you to another Altium Live 17 alumni speaker, um, which is Omar Majub from SKA in South Africa. And he has been designing really complex boards for the SKA, which is the Square Kilometer Array Telescope. Um, and I'm going to get out of the way and let Omer tell you a little bit about the SKA if it's something you don't know about. So Omer, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to tell us a little bit about your work. Hi Judy, uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So, so the SKA, which stands for the Square Kilometer Array, is a radio telescope project that's currently being built in South Africa and Australia. And its goal is to be the world's largest radio telescope upon completion. Um, I'm not sure if the listeners are familiar with what a radio telescope is, but essentially uh, opposed to an optical telescope, which is what most people are used to, which mm -hmm. you look through to see the stars and the planets and the sky, a radio telescope receives radio signals. So in essence, it's essentially a large satellite receiver. Or okay. radio signals. Okay. And so, yes. So tell us the purpose you know, of the data you're collecting in those receivers, those large receivers. You know, what type of data they're receiving and what the purpose is. Okay. So there, there are different purposes um, for radio telescopes. Uh, one of the main reasons is to observe the galaxy and to understand how the galaxy was formed and to understand how galaxies evolved, where they got their material, how they rotate and like what drives their rotation, what has shaped them and so on and also to track new galaxies that are forming and to just map that journey. There are other purposes are, for example, to study the Earth's magnetic fields, which help guide birds and bees and compass needles, and also to study interstellar gases. Another reason, which most people might be interested in, is also detect um, other signs of life out there, not necessarily aliens, but any, any objects which might be occurring in distant planets. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. All the big questions of life. <laughs> It, that's exactly it, and which is why a lot of questions have not been answered so far by existing telescopes, which is why we need to go bigger and more sensitive. So tell us a little bit about the scope of this project. I know it's massive, and what parts of the SKA are up already, and when is the due date that... Um, they feel this will be completed. Okay, so initially when this project was started, uh, it was so it's going to be a bid process between different countries for the hosting of, of the telescope itself, for the location of the telescope. And so initially, the three countries that were supposed to bid to be host were Argentina, South Africa, and Australia. South Africa and Australia um, their bid went ahead and it was between the two of them and it was then decided that both South Africa and Australia would host this. So the actual location of the telescope will be in South Africa and in Australia. And there are a number of member countries involved in this project since it's an international consortium, countries such as Brazil, France, Japan, Malta, South Korea, Poland, Portugal, Russia, Spain, and African countries as well, like Botswana, Ghana, Kenya, Madagascar, Mauritius, Mozambique, and Namibia, and Zambia. So once Australia and South Africa were bidding, they had to build what they call pathfinders or cursor telescopes to prove that they were capable of this. Mm -hmm. So the South African project at the time was called Meerkat, which is what we are currently busy with here in South Africa. And by March or April of this year, that should consist of at least 64 receivers or telescopes and then this will essentially be phase one of SKA. Okay so Meerkat is those 64 telescopes? Yes. Okay. There will be 64 telescopes making up phase one which towards the end should have at least 200 dishes. Okay so 64 is quite a 
<clears throat> quite a bit of the project, really. I mean, it's what? Yes. Over a it, 25% of the total project. Yes, yes. So, that, so that's, that's for phase one. Um, so just to explain a bit further between the two phases, for phase one, there will be the 200 dishes, including 64 meerkat dishes. But, mm -hmm. And in Australia, there will be 130,000 antennas for a f low frequency range. So the frequency range for meerkat is between 350 to 14 gigahertz. And then the low frequency antennas in Australia will be between 50 megahertz and 350 megahertz. That's a lot of power. <laughs> I can imagine the boards that you make. Right away, my mind goes to the boards. And are, <laughs> and is that just antennas, the antennal portions of the board? I mean, this is kind of a, a novice question, but how do you achieve that kind of power? So just to explain a little bit further on where I'm based with the team in South Africa, we work on what is called the, the digital back end. Okay. And what the digital back end is responsible for is that it basically is to receive the incoming radio signals from the dish, which are analog signals, and essentially digitize those signals and prepare them for processing before it's transmitted. Okay. So as you can imagine, our boards are mostly yes to, to digitize these signals and just perform the processing in them. Okay. Understood. Very good. Going on to, since you're kind of doing it, would it be fair to say that what you're doing there in South Africa and is sort of a little bit of the heavy lifting of this project then? Yes. You, yeah, I think you could say that. It would okay. be... Yeah. So tell us a little bit about specific challenges of designing these boards. I know before we got on the phone, you were talking specifically about BGA fan outs. Can you talk about that and and what kind of size BGAs that you typically work with and then how you address the fan outs for those? Sure. So we deal with a lot of FPGA processing boards. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a very high density board, very high density BGAs, starting from around 600 all the way to over 1,000 uh, balls. Wow. With very, very narrow pitches of less than a millimeter, 0 0.6, 0 0.6 millimeters. So it becomes very challenging to fan these out and route all the signals in between, which is why I was really glad to see um, all the advances on LTM-18 during the summit last year, which would have made our work tremendously easier had those oh, features good. been available sooner. Yes, but we will definitely be using those. And yeah, so that, that's one of our biggest challenges was definitely to fan out signals and the multitudes of high-speed signals that we have running on these boards. Have you, have you had the opportunity yet to transition to Altium Designer 18? Um, not yet, because we are still continuing our existing designs mm -hmm. on the existing version of LTM, but for whichever new design that we will be moving on to, we will definitely be on LTM 18. Okay. Um, that's, that's, those are really tight pitches, and I don't know how you guys do that, honestly. It boggles my mind. That's incredible. So... Um, talk a little bit more about the high-speed signaling and what kind of challenges that poses for you and, and how you address them. So some of the biggest challenges of this telescope is that it's an extremely sensitive device. So signal integrity is crucial for our boards. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the main issues we have, especially here in South Africa, is that our manufacturing capabilities, because the electronics industry is not very big here. So oh, having, having to send out a board, you know, with such narrow tracks and with these kind of um, technicalities, a lot of our local manufacturers are unable to actually manufacture them. Mm -hmm. so, so it becomes really tricky because another aspect of the project is also to help develop the local economy. So we've been working very closely with some local manufacturers to help them get the equipment and the expertise to be able to manufacture these kind of boards. So a lot of times, 
Yes. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about that. It's as one from the bare board industry and where I was focused on actually high speed boards for a long time. It, yeah. That's really fascinating to me because these boards are not easily made and there's not that many in the whole wide world actually. Yes. <laughs> that can build consistently and reliably um, in that yes. sort of phase you're talking about. So how, how do you go about and and where's the funding and how does that all work? So for example, um, some of our latest boards had uh, buried wires, buried and blind wires. And uh -huh. the manufacturers here just do not have the equipment to be able to manufacture, to, to be able to make those. Uh -huh. So we, a lot, some of them were able to get some government grants to buy some new equipment specifically for this project. Oh, good. So we were we were happy to assist them with that, and just even the etching process for these narrow for these narrow tracks is also quite complicated as opposed to your regular regular levels. Mm -hmm. So um, it's they are getting up to speed. Some some of our initial board that we needed were unfortunately had to be manufactured in China because we needed the quantities. But for the boards for which we were still prototyping, we were able to successfully manufacture those here in South Africa. And we were quite pleased with the results. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I love to hear that you're able to help, through the SKA, help grow the economy mm -hmm. and bring some technology there. That's very exciting. Yeah, that, that was one of the critical aspects of the SKA because the location of the SKA is also because you need a very radio quiet zone with no cell phone interference and that sort of thing. So it's actually based in the middle of the desert. And that's also the location has helped to uplift the community because now you know, schools get to benefit from that. A lot of extra jobs are created as well. So there, there is a lot of giving back involved with this project. I, I love that, Omar, that's really great news. And you know, sometimes people say, well, why go to space? Why build things like the SKA? Exactly. And yes, a, lot of, a lot of people always tell me, like, why is so much money being spent on this when, you know, it can be spent on housing or help to alleviate right. poverty without realizing that this does actually help people to uplift themselves. And that's, I couldn't have said it better, is what you realize is when you do start doing some of these things, not only is, is the data that you will collect helpful in us understanding really the the universe <laughs> and you yeah. know probably have practical applications um, that it does really help fuel communities and and put people to work and grow you know yeah. seed communities so yeah. I think that's a really lovely backstory I mean I think there's, there's been thousands of scholarships already for people to get into science and engineering from this project. Tell me a little bit more about that. So um, a lot of times uh, people, for example, from the town where the, where the telescope is based, mm -hmm. a lot of student studies are being paid for and a lot of them are being sponsored to attend university, especially in the STEM fields. Because once this project is complete, we are going to need a lot of astronomers and engineers to work on this telescope because this is a very long term project. I mean, it, it's only expected to be completed around 2024. So by that time, we would need to develop the skills for people to use this and to maintain it. That's incredible. So speaking of students, how in the world <laughs> does Omar Majoub from South Africa end up working on the SKA, <laughs> you know, based in a remote area. Tell us a little bit about you and, and how you came to the field that you are. All right. So I studied electronic engineering at the University of Pretoria, which is about 1,500 kilometers from here, from Cape Town. And I was previously working in the electronic defense industry for about four or five years. And then I think at some point my CV was somewhere online. I wasn't actively looking for a job, but my CV just happened to be online and I was contacted for this. And since this was in a different town, I wasn't really considering moving at the time, but I just decided to go for the interview anyway. And once I got it, I started to seriously consider it and I saw what a great opportunity it would be. 
and I decided to accept, and it's been six years now. That's a great story. So, Omar, do you remember being a kid and kind of naturally being drawn uh, to how things worked, and how did you how did you know to choose that major? So, I I was always interested in gadgets. Mm -hmm. That was something that I enjoyed. I enjoyed gadgets. And, but I feel, I think my parents actually fooled me into studying engineering because <laughs> as a kid, a, as a kid, I used to, I used to love the TV show MacGyver and I would always ask my parents like, you know, what is he? What does he do? And they would tell me, no, he's an engineer. That's what his job is. And ever since then, I had wanted to study engineering <laughs> and it was only later on that I realized that they had actually lied to me. <laughs> God bless parents. <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad that they did. Yeah. Well, you you obviously have, uh, you wouldn't have lasted long if you didn't have sort of the propensity for it. So they must have yeah. done something right. I, yeah. I knew a fellow, um, Omer, that told me once he was an electrical engineer and he was part of early development of mm -hmm. chips and the, actually okay. the, the 256K chip you know, right. way back in the olden days. And um, he was from a small town in the Midwest. And he saw some men climbing telephone poles. And he mm -hmm. asked his parents, what does that guy do? And they said, he's an engineer. So he's like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an engineer because <laughs> he wanted to climb telephone poles. <laughs> <laughs> then he got to college and he's like, you people are never going to let me climb a telephone pole, are you? <laughs> but then he ended up being quite a genius guy and developing chipsets. So. And ho hopefully he climbed some telephone poles in his spare time. <laughs> his son went to Princeton. I think there were some brains in that family, by the way. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that he ever got to climb a telephone pole. So, well, can you share? Um, some websites because I'm sure there are some incredible photos. I know I've seen some. Ah, oh, yes. Um, okay. Share the websites where people can go both to your local website and to the the international website. So our local website, SKA Africa, is at www.ska.ac.za and the international site is www.skatelescope.org Very good. So I I always ask people at the end of this podcast this is this we are now shifting to what I call designers after hours. Okay. So I think there's a lot of artistry and creativity in designers like you. And so what kind of interesting hobbies or things do you do in your spare time? In my spare time, I, well, I naturally I enjoy video games. I love playing video games. Mm. And I like to consider myself to be a sporty person. I, my, I love playing tennis and soccer. I try to play at least three to four times a week. Wow. So those are things that I, I try to stay active, you know, especially after sitting in an office all day staring at your computer screen. <laughs> Yeah, that totally makes sense. Well, so would you say to, um, yeah. would you say you were a geek or a nerd? <laughs> <laughs> I would say neither, but perhaps more of a nerd. Wow, you're more of a nerd. Well, um, probably with the stuff you're working on, I'm uh, not going to argue with that one. <laughs> well, it's been a delight to speak speak with you, Omer. Is there anything else you'd like to share that we haven't covered, perhaps? Um, not not really, but I just want to say that I'm really excited about getting to use LTM18. I'm so, I'm so envious after having seen all the videos. I've actually installed it and played around with it a bit, but I'm looking forward to using it and seeing how easy it will make my future designs. Well, we're excited for, for you to use it also, and we hope that You'll have the opportunity to come back to Altium Live 18. We will oh, make sure to post Omer's uh, presentation below where he spoke and and had some incredible sl slides. And not only that, he was like a stand-up comedian. I stepped into his 
his uh, obsession and I was trying hard not to laugh really loud because they were filming but he, he, you know he's he's been the straight man during this call but he was really <laughs> funny like t tell the audience why the United States is not part of SKA <laughs> <laughs> uh. Oh, that, that was not supposed to have been. I, I still don't know how I didn't remove that. <laughs> I love it. No, tell us. But, what was it? <laughs> so the, the United States, the reason they were not supposed to be part of the SKA, the reason they're not part of the SKA is because they would have insisted that it would be called the 0.386 square mile array. <laughs> it's too wordy. <laughs> uh, too many words. Yeah, SKA. It's way easier. Yep. Well, we will definitely post your uh, your presentation below, both video and your slide deck, because there are some beautiful photos uh, in your slide deck that show some radio telescopes and some sites that are really inspiring, and the scope is boggles the mind. So um, we will be sure to share that. So. Omar, thank you again so much for sharing your experience with us. And we hope to talk to you soon, especially after you've gotten on All Team Designer 18 and give us some feedback so we can make it I better. Definitely will do. I'll try to find some bugs. <laughs> okay. It's on. Thanks a lot, Judy. <laughs> thank you so much. This Thanks. has been Thanks. Judy Warner with the On Track Podcast. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, always remember to stay on track.